So hey guys, wow, that was awesome. You almost said my name correctly, that's good. It's, everybody messes it up, so. Um, so yeah, I'm talking about keeping your HTML semantic. A lot of us use a lot of frameworks, which I think are awesome, I love frameworks. But um, I think we sort of sacrificed a little bit of the semantic nature of HTML, which we kind of learned to do, so that's really what the talk is about. Uh, this is the presentation, which you can get to by going to this URL down here. And if you want to, you can uh, click in here to check into the presentation. Um, I have like a Linda subscription to give away if you want to. How many people here um, have heard, like, are members of Linda? So there's quite a few, that's awesome. Yeah, I was a total like groupie of Linda before I joined, so I really love it. Um, we have thousands of courses, uh, and I, I'm up to like 30 now, I think, since I send them that, that, um, you know, that note. So it's really fun to work for them. It's a great company. So um, anyways, uh, check out the presentation is right here. And um, it's clickable, so if you click on my name, you'll get to my contact info on this first homepage, um, which is just a Gravatar link, has all my other stuff if somebody wants to get a hold of me. All right, so like I said, I really do love frameworks. Frameworks are awesome. I just want, before I talk badly about frameworks, I want to kind of uh, do a sandwich and tell you how much I lo love them and I use them all the time. I love Bootstrap. Um, and I actually have a couple of courses on Bootstrap. Um, you know, it just make it easy, um, you know, get you started super easy. I remember the first time I learned Bootstrap, I did like a website for a bar camp like that night, like in four hours. I was able to pick it all up and learn it because it's so simple. You just put in a few classes here and there and you've got a great looking responsive website that you can get done in, you know, just a few hours, right? So um, the, probably the easiest way to get into responsive design, um, I'm not a big math fan, so uh, it's really gives you a style already that's better than what you get if you don't have any styles already. So it's very easy to get into prototyping with something like Bootstrap. You can get into it immediately and have something that looks pretty decent. It doesn't look like a browser style, it's just like years in time, senior Roman. Um, and it does have a lot of awesome built-in components. So it has you know, things like a carousel, things like a you know, scroll spy, and all kinds of other things that will be kind of hard for you to code. So if you've got a quick project that you don't have a lot of time to put on, it's a great way of getting started. Um, however, also obviously it's been tested, uh, battle tested quite a bit. It works with a lot of older browsers. I think it, the current version goes back to like nine, but if you go to the version 2.0, it even lets you go back to earlier browsers as well. However, there's some problems that I, that I have with the, with the frameworks, and essentially, number one is they're very heavy. You, you know, they take up a lot of space, not just in the framework itself, but the JavaScript is very big, the CSS is, get, is very big, uh, and so that's, that's always turned me off um, against them because sometimes you don't really, if you're trying to do like a single page website with some basic info, you don't need that much stuff to get started. And you don't need all the fancy JavaScript features. Sometimes you just need like a clean page. So that is uh, discouraging. It makes a lot of sites look the same. You can kind of tell what the bootstrap look is like. So um, again, that's, you know, if you just want to get something up, that's great. But it, sometimes I think too many of the sites look exactly the same. And so another, the big concern that I have about it is that you end up with some code that looks like this. And you have like a div and then um, you have maybe like some, you know, some um, different classes here and they start getting really verbose when you say something like column small five, medium four, visible large, and then you maybe have a print style here. Uh, and uh, it just, it's just like too much non-semantic code that if you had to update the site and change the layout, you'd have to go into your HTML and mess around with all this code all over the place, which is kind of the way that we're not supposed to work with HTML. Uh, so it's, it becomes like really hard to maintain bootstrap code, especially when the sites are bigger. Um, and so that's kind of, I feel guilty um, about you know working with bootstrap and um, I also feel guilty because at the same time, like I don't really like to do prefixes at all. I, I wish there weren't any. And so I, I wish there was a way that I could just code in, you know, if I need a drop shadow, I wouldn't have to worry about, okay, do I, 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 do I have to go to can I use and figure out which versions of browsers I'm supporti supporting and go back to those versions and stuff. Um, and, you know, any math that produces that number uh, is not something that humans should be doing, right? Like why, why is there a, a width for a column that's like 48.3, that's just ridiculous. Uh, computers should be able to handle that and we shouldn't really have to worry about math. After all, you know, we're designers or programmers, but that's something computers should be doing, right? 
And I really don't want to wait until IA goes away. So I really don't want to have to worry about which version of things I'm using. I'm, I kind of want something that makes th life easier for me because I like to do things fast and uh, conveniently if possible. So what I'm going to be showing you is essentially first talking about the workflow that I use for creating responsive sites. I think a big reason why people don't use things like SAS and process languages is because it's really hard to get started. And it's hard to develop a workflow that actually makes your life easier. That's really what you're looking for. You want to be quicker, faster, more efficient, write better code that creates less HTTP requests, that is you know, well-formed code. And uh, you don't want to have to, like, if you, if you use a lot of pre-processed languages, you have to go install this thing and then run this command. And you, you need something that makes your life a little bit easier. Um, so I'm going to show you the workflow that I use and talk about the tools that I use for setting that up. Um, and then also talk about the tools that, is gonna, that are going to make my life easier when working with CSS. Um, things like not having to worry about browser prefixes, um, things that make it easier to use something like Flexbox, which is really crazy because you have to write the code in like all these different versions. Um, and then, you know, just find ways of making your life faster, it's like doing media queries easier, creating breakpoints and grid systems that are easier to do uh, with some different tools that, that SAS works really well with. So so that we end up with uh, no dirty classes that you know, are stuck into our HTML and become really hard to maintain later on. So uh, the, the amazing thing too is that once you start using this process, you'll end up thinking about layout, not math. You'll be going, I'd really like to have, say, a six column grid here, and I want the, the gutters to be kind of, you know, this size. You'll be thinking like that as opposed to, okay, I need to pull out my calculator to calculate how this layout is gonna work out. Um, so, you'll start thinking differently about creating this stuff. And so what we're going to be doing is creating this site. I already have a copy of it open, so I'm not going to click on that link. Uh, let's see. It's the other way. All right, so this is, like, this is a site that I did for one of my courses, and it, it has a lot of features, not just the responsive part. Um, for example, like if you scroll up, no matter what size I make the window, um, as soon as you scroll up, that'll, it, it'll begin the navigation, the navigation docs. It also highlights as I go to different places. Also, if you click on these, they'll scroll down and up to the pos to position, right? That's all stuff that actually I'm not gonna show you. But you can look at the code, I'll show, yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, guys. Um, if you go to the slides, you'll see that there's, a, there's a, actually a GitHub page somewhere in here. And if not, I'll, I'll add it to the slides because I thought I just added it in. But um, there's a lot of other cool stuff in there. But I'm focusing just on the responsive part right now. And you can hit me up. And maybe if I finish really quick, we can totally dig into it. Um, but the responsive parts, this is probably the, the, better, the best example that I have of, of the responsiveness of the site. Um, if you make this smaller, um, at some point, this will become a, from a three-column layout, uh, this section will become a one-column layout at the top, right, and a two-column layout underneath. And then at a certain point, it's just going to become a one-column layout, right? And notice, like, the icons are also the icons. When the page is really wide, they are there with the text. When the page gets a little thinner, it's just the text. And then when it gets really small, it's just the icons. I, I don't have a thing against the hot dog menu. It kind of annoys me. Like, what is that? So I, I think icons are kind of cool, and you sort of get them. Uh, so um, if you take a look at the code for this page, oh, um, you'll notice that there isn't any heavy markup. Uh, it's also super compressed. Like you can tell, wow, this is tight HTML. I don't write like this. This is not, I'm not an alien or anything. <laughs> this is all part of the workflow, too. You can tell your workflow, hey, I'm ready to go to production. Compress the CSS, minify it. Because you want to read all that. Like, you want to read your CSS how it is, right? You want to read your HTML, how you wrote it, have lots of comments. But when you go to production, you want to get rid of all that, you know, reduce the amount of HTTP calls. Um, and the workflow does that for you, right? Uh, but there are no, you know, this is uh, three columns me when it's on medium size, two columns when it's on large size, et cetera, et cetera. It's all just very simple HTML. So um, maybe in a minute I'll pull the, the version of this that you can read. Um, and the same thing about the CSS. If you look at the CSS, um, it's all compressed and, and super minified. And it's quite tiny when it's all compressed like that. So um, let's see. There's some other sections that are kind of interesting. Let's see. If um, this one has a couple of hidden things. Like when you reduce the size, it goes from five photos to four photos, um, and then they disappear when it's smaller. And uh, this has animation features, which I, I got, I'm not showing you either. Sorry. Um, we'll go back into. So it has like tweens. Uh, this section is a two-column layout, and then when you get to a certain size, it goes to a one-column 
layout. Actually, it, it reduces in size at some point, and then it goes to like a one column layout. So all that is just traditional responsive CSS. The difference is this has no, you know, no non-semantic markup like in the HTML, and there's like a tween that happens at the end. So, so that's kind of what I'm trying to show you. And to do that, I need to first uh, show you the workflow that I use and then go into the details of the technology that I use, right? So again, first the workflow. Why do I need it? Um, you can, if you're pushing stuff onto the web, you know, and I've, I've known for a long time, it's better to have one call to one CSS file, one call to one JavaScript file. Do I do it? Not if I, not if I can't help it because it's a pain, right? You gotta, I mean, you, you either have to have some tool that does it or you have to go do it yourself manually, like compress all that stuff. And it's, you don't want to do that. You just want to be laying things out or focusing on the code. You don't really need to worry about things that the computer should be doing anyways, right? So compressing, making the files as small as possible, getting rid of comments, getting rid of uh, white space. Uh, concatenating means just joining together JavaScript documents so that it's a single server call as opposed to 18. Um, and then minifying just means making everything as small as possible. You know, you're just getting rid of everything that's extra. So. I guess it's kind of the same thing as compress. So less HTTP requests, and the workflow out will take care of everything, right? It'll take care of all preprocessors. That's another thing about using a lot of these tools. Like, say you're trying to use CoffeeScript and less or SAS. Uh, well, you got to have a, you know, you got to have a, maybe a terminal command that runs and compresses your your SAS, and then you have a different one that compresses your CoffeeScript, and then you have to have something else that minifies the code. Um, and so this kind of workflow does like all that for you, right? Uh, and then it also, it's super handy to have live reloading available to you. And so this kind of stuff takes care of that. And also the ability to create development and production builds. You saw the production version of that website and how compressed it was. Uh, but I don't want to read that most of the time, right? So some of the tools that we have. Depen it really depends on how easy you want to get into it. Um, if you don't like, the, if you hate the terminal, then there's a lot of really excellent um, GUI tools that you can use. The two major ones are uh, Prepros, which is cross-platform, and CoKid, which is Mac only, but you know it's kind of super awesome. Uh, so just go check those out if you're interested in an easy workflow. The disadvantage is that if you are working in a team environment, um, you have to have a license for everybody you know, that has the copy of whatever you're using. And then it's kind of hard to share your settings. So when you share a project with somebody else, it's sort of hard to get them to get the same settings that you have on your machine. Um, so I, I go command line because you know, after you get used to it, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, and the other tools, the two big ones, there's, a, there's other ones that you can get, but the two big ones are Gulp and Grunt. I happen to be a fan of, of Gulp uh, just because it makes more sense to me. Um, so you can check them both out. I really think people always ask me, which one should I learn? You should learn both. More stuff is done in Grunt because it's the older one that's been around the longest. Um, but Gulp, I think, just makes sense to me. It's also JavaScript. as a, Like, the configuration in Grunt is uh, JSON. So um, the configuration in Gulp is JavaScript, so, which means that you have access to, like, loops, variables. You can do some things in Gulp that are a little bit harder to do in Grunt. Uh, and if you can, if you see the structure, and I'll show it to you in a minute, it, it makes a lot of sense. Like it's, here's my inputs, here's the things that I want to do, here's where I want you to output it, and then you use the same commands over and over. I think in Grunt, I noticed that you do some, you do like some things in one plugin a certain way, and then in another plugin, it's kind of like a different way. So, that, you know, but they're they're similar. They do the same stuff, and enough people use Grunt that you probably need to like at least know how to read it, right? Um, the difference between the GUI and the command line tools is simplicity versus flexibility. Uh, the nice thing about Grunt and Gulp is that the configuration travels with the project. So when you share the project folder with somebody else, they have everything they need to run the automation. And not only that, but they have the exact versions of the plugins that you're using. So say you're using SAS or, or anything else. Say you're using like Life Reloading. They have the version of that thing that you're using, the version of Express and Node that you're using. So when they run it, you know that it's going to work because they don't have some new version that's not compatible with what you were doing. Everybody's on the same exact path, you know, path and the same exact version. So, all right, so let's get into SAS a little bit. So why would you need pre-processing? And how many people here use like SAS or less? So a lot of you, yeah, this is the, probably the right conference, right? Everybody loves, right? Well. Um, Chris Coyer did like a survey uh, along, uh, I think it's about a year and a half or so ago. 
And um, this was the numbers way back when uh, that he got from the survey. 46% had never tried it. I think it's, you know, more people have tried it by now. 54% uh, had tried it. And out of the people that tried it, 83% of them uh, liked it. There's a 4% 4, 4 bunch of weird people that hate, I don't know what happened to them, but they hated it. And 13% just didn't really care. Uh, uh, so and a pretty large sample size, so that's pretty cool. Well, if you take that and compare it to like other addiction tracks, you know that a very small percentage of like people get addicted like crack and heroin compared to like how much people get addicted to like SAS. It's really awesome, not just SAS, but any preprocessor. So I, if you haven't tried it yet, I'm telling you, it really changes your life. And hopefully I'll show you some things that you'll go, oh my gosh, I gotta have that. Like I, that's just gonna save me so much time, right? So another question I get is, okay, which one should I use? Because people wanna learn like one thing and I'm totally down with that. Like I don't, I don't, I didn't wanna, I, I remember when jQuery and I don't know, prototype and all these other JavaScript libraries, I didn't wanna learn 20 of them. I just want to learn one. Same thing with games nowadays. Like if you want to learn a game library, there's like 200 of them. And you're like, I don't have time to learn 200, right? So lesser success. Honestly, uh, they're almost identical. So, I, you know, the difference is like, I think on one of them, you use the um, at sign for variables and the other one you use a dollar sign. Other than that, it's almost exactly the same structure, code, and features. Um, SAS does require that you install Ruby, so it's a slightly harder installation. Um, and you should learn both because, again, enough projects are written in each one that it would just be, you would just be a better developer if you understand both. And honestly, you're gonna learn dollar versus at sign, and that's pretty much gonna be, it's almost like when you go to PHP and you have to learn, I can never remember this. Uh, concatenation, is a, it's a period, I think, on PHP, and in JavaScript, it's like a plus. And it drives you nuts, right? When you go, when you're like in one, you go to the other one. It's like, dang it, what's going on? Like stuff, it's breaking, right? So just learn both of them. Again, there's not much to learn. I personally go for SAS. Um, I think it's just more fun. Um, so why why do people love SAS? It has. I'm going to go through the features. A lot of people here know SAS, and you probably have heard about it enough. So I'm going to go through the features um, of SAS pretty quickly. I'm trying to use some examples that I think most of them come from the actual project that I that I worked in. So of course it gives you uh, variables and other utilities. So for example, we have the ability to create colors and assign them to a variable, and then we can just call up that color whenever we want. But not only that, we can also say, this is awesome, I, I love coding like this. Like, you can also tell any color to just be a darker version of itself. Like, have you ever, just like, man, I don't know why but this particular color doesn't work on this background. If it was just like a little bit lighter or a little bit darker, it would be perfect. But I don't want to have to pull another like hexadecimal color or some sort, like, what's, what's with RGB, right? It's like some sort of alien system that you can't memorize what the color, like when you try to think of a color, right? So, um, you know, this, is, this has a lot of utilities that say, I want to make this color partially transparent. You just feed it a color. You say how transparent you want to make it. You just tell it to be darker. You adjust the hue saturation lightness if you want. Feed it something on any measurement system and it just adjusts it. So you end up, like that is the first thing that changes your life. You never do color the same way again. Um, and I, you know, some people get mad if you define a color as like red. Um, I, I do it, I'm sorry, because it just, I can't remember what main color means when I'm reading the code, so that's just me, so don't, don't do it like me. Uh, all right, so you can also do nesting, which is super popular, and just a way of keeping your code much better, much more organized. So this is what normal CSS looks like without nesting. SAS looks like this. Everything stays in the same place, um, and you just indent and nest things. I mean, you don't need to actually indent, but you just put the ULs inside the PIX grid, and then you do the LIs. Uh, and et cetera, et cetera. And it's just easier to read. Everything's in one place. You know where it is. You know that, you know, because what happens to me a lot, I'm, I'm sure it happens to you, like you start developing something and then later on you want to add a style, but you want it to, you want to make sure that it's going to apply. So you put it at the end, right? And then you like keep on going and then you re re recognize that you have like styles for something here and then they're also here. This way it makes you keep everything in the same place and it makes it easier to maintain again. So it's better. All right, so you have operators, so you can say uh, multiplication, division, you know, um, all that stuff is built in. Um, oh, you also have 
uh, the ability to create if and else statements, like if then statements, you can create loops, any kind of control structure. So it gives you like JavaScript -like, like capabilities in your CSS. Again, that's, I mean, just think about it. If you could only have JavaScript and CSS, wouldn't that make CSS so much different if you could have functions? And this is, that's what this does. Uh, you can also create mixins, which just allow you to create functions that you can call back and then reuse throughout your code. So that's pretty cool. Right, so I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell too much on so, so modularity is another really important thing. Um, you can you start thinking of your CSS as not one gargantual file because you know that eventually all that stuff is going to comp get compressed, minified, and unified into a single document. So you start using those add import f rules all the time, and SAS is going to take care of combining them for you. It's actually going to not just refer to them, but actually suck them into a document, combine them, and then output put them in a compressed format for you. So you start coding differently because you know that it's easier to just separate the navigation CSS into its own place so that you can get back to it uh, immediately, right? All right, so, so what does Compass do? Well, Compass is just a bunch of, essentially a bunch of mix-ins for SAS. So SAS lets you create functions. Compass is just a set of functions that let you do things that you would normally common do. So uh, commonly do. So for example, um, an easier way of doing CSS3 CSS shadows where you don't have to worry about prefixes. You just learn the syntax for shadows and Compass. And it's exact, actually, it's exactly the same syntax as what you would do in CSS, so it's easy to learn. Um, and then it takes care of figuring out whether or not you need the browser prefixes. Same thing with transitions, gradients, and also Flexbox. It figures out Flexbox is a pain to use because a, there's a lot of different ways that you have to do it to get it to work on different browsers. This takes care of all that for you. So it makes writing CSS like really fun. Like you forget about, oh, what up, you know, at CSS3, please, or I need to go to can I use, or, you know, should I be doing that? You just kind of use SAS and Compass together and everything's super happy. Um, it also has cool utility features, like whenever I wanna, you know, have you guys written this rule hundred, hundreds of times, like H1, H2, H3, H4, H5, H6. You just do headings and then you put your code in there and it does all that heading code for you. So it has a lot of little utility features like that. Uh, and then this is what the CSS3 features look like. You can say I wanna do a text, uh, text shadow um, and you use the add include command. Once you import um, SAS and Compass, then you could just use these mixins and then just say, hey, I want a text shadow. You don't have to worry about browser support. It does all the prefixes for you automatically. Um, and then this is what um, centering vertically and horizontally on Flexbox would be like. Uh, just three lines of code and it does it. And you don't have to worry about whether or not you know the browser supports it. It's, I mean, if a browser doesn't support it, it's not going to work. There are some compatibility things that you can do, but anyway, so, okay, so Suzy is kind of the main thing that um, I'm talking about or I'm kind of showing you that's different, if, especially if you've used SAS before in Compass, you know it's awesome. It, you're like in the 84% or more. So SUSE allows you to create res your own responsive grid system. Now, this is different than something like, say, the 960 grid system or something like Bootstrap. Those things give you a 12-column grid, um, and that's what you get. I mean, you can customize Bootstrap by going to the side and filling out that form, but nobody does it. Like, I, I don't have time for that to like output like a custom thing. Uh, whereas using something like Suzy just allows you to create not only your, cu your own custom grid system, but at any time in the process, you can actually customize the grid system. You know, you always run into the instance where, yeah, I got like a 12 column grid here, but what I really ne need is something that's just, I don't know, that's three columns and that has thicker gutters. Like for this one instance, I, I, don't, I need a slightly different grid system. Suzy doesn't really care it lets you create the grid systems on the fly and also readjust them. So I'll show you some code in a minute. Takes care of all the math for you, which is awesome. Uh, one grid system really isn't enough. And 12 columns is great, but it's all, sometimes not the, the one that you need. And you need control over those things without having to like output a, you know, a separate CSS file. All right? uh, and it really, like I said, makes laying out fun. You're, you're not thinking about um, how to do things or whipping out your like slide rule and calculating like the the weird percentages you're just thinking what do i need here i need you know two columns this many gutters i need a layout that's a container that's this much percent of the width of the browser uh, and it makes it fun so here's kind of what it looks like you start off by creating your defaults for your project just like you would and well actually you don't do this in bootstrap but if you're customizing bootstrap you do this but with SUSE, you just say okay my default grid system is going to be 12 columns with a container so the container would be um, if you have a layout 
that's responsive and you want the, uh, the main, some sort of section to get no bigger than a certain size, that's what your container is. Uh, and so you can say my default container is 60 amps or whatever measurement system you want. Uh, and then position of the gutters, there's actually a lot of options for this. You can go crazy, there's this many options. However, this is kind of like the ones that I use in my project, right? Uh, and you can click in here for the rest of the options if you want to. Uh, and then what you do is, when you are ready to lay something out, you say something like, um, I want to uh, include an element that spans four columns. This, these are um, two elements, and this should be like outdented. I copied it and took out a bunch of stuff here, so it should be really more like that. These are at the same level. So what you do is you say, okay, this first element's gonna take up four columns, and then the other one is gonna take um, the rest of the columns, right? Uh, starting, it's gonna use eight columns, because it's a 12-column system, uh, starting at position four of 12. Uh, that's it. You've just laid out you know, a two-column grid with that system, and you can modify any of that at any time, and you can uh, nest and all that stuff. And you do that within the CSS for those sections, uh, which makes it really easy to do. So. Uh, you can overwrite anything at any time. So remember we did a container back here that was 60 M's. Well, here I'm saying I, I still want a container, but now I want it to take up 95% of the width of the browser instead of what I told you earlier. No problem. Susie's going to take care of the math for you. It's going to take care of creating that, that CSS for you. All you got to think about is what do I want my, my container to do, and it's just going to take care of it. Um, uh, so you can also say, I want a layout that is on my grid system, so it's using the, the defaults, a 12-column grid with a container, but this time I want to pat one column on each side. Boom, you're done. You can say pat one, two, three, four columns, and you can also redefine the columns. Like, if you don't like the way the columns are, you can say, hey, I, I want a six-column grid instead of a 12-column grid, and you'll get bigger sizes. It's really, you're no longer thinking, you never think about math, all you think is layout. How, how do I want it to look? what should my columns be, and it does the rest of the stuff for you. So it's really free. It also has um, utilities. Uh, if you need to create a gallery, you just say, hey, I want to include this gallery mix in, and um, I want the galleries to take up these, these amount of columns and stuff. And that's, you just put in your, the rest of your code in there, and you're done. Um, so I'll, I'll show you that. I used that, at that in that little grid of uh, images earlier. So Susie's going to take care of the layout. Um, media queries can get complicated. The, I, you know, do, I, I always have to look that up. Like, is it uh, add media um, and then something else, right? I don't, have to, I, I don't use that anymore. So uh, the, the, the way you write the queries can get complicated. So there's a, there's a library called Breakpoint that makes that easier. Um, and what you do is you essentially create some, um, some um, variables that are your different breakpoints. You say, okay, um, I need a breakpoint at this width, this width, this width. Right. And then what you do is you can say, for this section that I'm working on, I'm going to use the, um, the high tide breakpoint. I mean, they have funny names here, but you can say my medium breakpoint. And that is the same thing as doing a min, uh, a min width of that medium breakpoint. You can also say, if you put two numbers, uh, you can say, I want to go, uh, you can say, um, yeah. So when you define your variables, you can actually define them like this and have variables that are actually combinations that get fed into breakpoint, and it'll take care of writing the complicated media queries automatically. So it's, again, you're not thinking about how do you do that and look, look it up on CSS tricks. You just kind of take care of what you need to take care of. You think about layout, and you get your work done a lot quicker. So a lot of really other cool examples in there. Um, this is the um, breakpoint sizes that I designed for that, that website. Um, so you could just define some like that, and then you can use, um, you can use like say, I've got this room section, right? And normally I wanna make it look like this, but whenever the breakpoint is small, I want you to pad it um, seven columns on one side and, and one column on the right. And uh, if you remember what this looks like, this is the rooms. So that's these guys right here. Um, so when they get to a certain size, I think uh, they kind of get pushed off to the side. I'm not sure why. Okay, so I have to adjust a little bit there. But when I make them smaller, they're going to be more centered. So 
they're centered here. And then when they get at a certain break point, just push them up to the side. See, I'm not thinking about math. I'm just going, how do I want them to look? I give the, the tools, the code that I want when I'm thinking, and then it takes care of the math for me. So, so you really want that, right? <laughs> uh, let's see. So I think what I'm going to do now is, how, how am I doing on time, by the way? What time is it? Let's see. What, 15 minutes? Awesome. Okay, so I, I want to actually show you some of the code on, that I use for creating the page. Um, any questions? I'm just going to go into code and show you like how different things are put together so you get a better idea of how it works. But any questions before I go on about what I'm doing? You guys have been super quiet, man. I'm either doing super awesome or horrible. It always happens. Awesome? Oh, right on. Awesome. Cool. All right, so I'll keep on going. I know you guys are shy. You'll think of something. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I think this particular system is SaaS based. So I, I don't know what, you know, if there is an equivalent for, for less, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, I think that's one of probably the, the reasons why I like SaaS a little better. It has better frameworks built in for them. So um, the, um, SaaS has Compass and it's had it for a long time. Um, it also has something called Bourbon and then Bourbon has its own layout system as well. I think that the libraries for, for SaaS are a little bit richer than the ones for less. But if somebody knows something else, because I'm a SaaS person, so I could be wrong. But yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I forgot to show you my process. I'm sorry. I'll get into that. Sorry. Grunt. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, um, you know, the difference between Grunt and Gulp, and in addition to it being JavaScript based, it's uh, what they call a streaming system. So it's for bigger projects, it's a lot better than, than Grunt um, because every, everything that you run, like say you're processing like a bunch of SaaS or you're processing like CoffeeScript into JavaScript, all those things run as different processes and it doesn't have to go through and recompile like the whole thing. It just it, they're always running, and whenever it notices a change, it runs that process, and it updates the, and injects the site with the changes. There's a live reload, and it's, it's supposed to be a lot faster, especially on the, the bigger you make your projects. So yeah, thank you for reminding me. I'm supposed to show you like this freaking awesome like process, right? Okay, sorry, I get excited about everything, and and I just start talking. It's the thing about authors, like we just love to talk, and we get lost sometimes. All right, so here's the automation that I have built in. Um, my structure goes something like this. Um, I have just a standard kind of Node.js file structure, so a lot of these folders you might notice from Node.js, uh, just because I use Git also to manage my project, um, and it has just all these different files that you need. The important one in here is this golf file.js. So this golf file essentially is calling a bunch of plugins into the pro program. The way that um, it gets those plugins is by using Node.js, to read this thing called package.json. Um, it'll read this and go, okay, here's the versions that this person used for this project. And this is where I'm telling you that if you share this with somebody else, they're not gonna have compatibility issues because they're using the exact same version number that you're using, so it's never a problem. Um, and this uh, essentially is read by this gulf file. Actually, the package.json is gonna generate this folder called node modules that actually brings in all the plugins in one place. Also, this is why I say that uh, your configuration files travel with the project, or at least the settings files does. You don't always include this folder. You can totally delete it and, and just include the rest of it. It's, it usually goes in your gitignore, uh, and when you upload it to GitHub or whatever, and then uh, if somebody has the package.json, all they have to do is like run a command, npm install, and it'll recreate the, that node um, modules folder for you. The problem with including this note modules is that it's really big. Every one of these folders has its own package.json file and its own node modules folder that also has the own package.json file and their own node modules and this can go on for a while so uh, I don't I don't um, recommend including that. So apparently I got 10 minutes I got a haul right now. So um, all right, the Gulf file, 
calls those things and then sets up some, um, some what do you call it, automation, which essentially is saying, right now I want to run in a production environment. So that's why you saw the files be super compressed. But if I change this to development and I saved it and I rerun my automation, I think it's on the same window here. Maybe not, it's right here. So I'm going to control C here and just rerun it. So there it is running again. If I refresh this page and I look at the source, now it's super readable. And if you looked at the CSS, it would also be super readable, it has all the comments. It has like extra comments and it also has SAS maps. Uh, with the new version of Compass and SAS, you get maps so that when you're looking at uh, your developer tools, you can actually see the reference to the SAS, which is another way that it helps. This is how you want to be coding, but not how you want to send to production because it's just going to generate like a massive file. Right? Uh, in addition to that, then what I do is I set up, hey, look um, at these different libraries and bring them in and combine them and compress them together. And then you set up a series of tasks, right? And uh, the tasks essentially say, okay, this is my JavaScript task. I want you to take the, all my JavaScript items, right? All these JS sources that I specified here. And then I want you to, uh, if, hold on, JS sources, I want you to combine them into a single document. Um, this Browserify, what it does is it'll, it allows you to include libraries automatically. So if your project is using jQuery, it'll just go grab jQuery for you. You don't have to include it. Um, and then um, if this is production, then I want you to uglify it, which means change the variable names of my JavaScript so that they're smaller. They still do the same thing, but you've got smaller names. Again, in, in development, you want to use like these big, I, I like to use big JavaScript names so that I know what the heck stuff is, right? But um, what you call it, um, and then you just run a series of tasks. Notice that there is a compass task, which does all the co compass and SAS stuff, as well as this task called watch, which just sits there in the background while I'm doing stuff and updates. And uh, that's probably all I need to show you. And then you just say, this is kind of my 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 uh, my workflow. Take care of it, and it does it does it all. I don't ever have to um, worry about how um, you know which other plugins to run this. And also, when somebody gets my structure, my little folder, they get all this automation built in. All they have to do is run the gulp command, maybe specify the environment, and that's pretty much it. So I don't know if I have that much time, um, but I'll show you what the style.css essentially brings in a bunch of plugins with the add import that I showed you. It, Im it imports the SUSE and breakpoint libraries, as well as any of the compass libraries that I'll be using in my project. Uh, the nice thing about Compass and SAS is that it's really smart. It's, if you bring in something, it's not going to use it unless you're actually using it. Like It's not going to output extra CSS if you, if you didn't use uh, Flexbox. It's not going to do something with that at all. It's just going to output the code that it needs. So that's pretty cool. And then you know, I create all my, my different pages to be super modular. And then you have the variable sections where you define your color. So yeah, I do use color names, but then I can do something like have another variable that just calls upon those color names. So that then I can just modify my color names here that I understand, and then they'll go into the different sections. Um, yeah, here's my breakpoint variables. And then I usually divide stuff in the, the main styles for my entire project. Here's that heading stacks that I showed you. Um, and then the basic layout of the page. Notice the breakpoints. So this is a scene which is every sort of section, this is almost, this is a single page website, so this would be my quote unquote pages. A scene consists of this, um, these parameters, and then how they behave at different breakpoints. When it's wide, I want you to add a little bit of padding, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and then layout, mix, these are a couple of mixes that I make. Um, I have that, usually a big background, full screen background image, and I wanted to add the ability to do gradients just in case any text is sitting on top of it. So I wrote a couple of mixins that, that, that do this. If you go to the GitHub project, you, you get all this all, as well. And then I have a, mod, a modules folder that has each of my different sections. And you can see how I use um, SAS, Compass, as well as Breakpoint and Susie, and it just, I mean, I'm telling you, you, you don't have to think about how you're doing something, you just have to think about how you're laying out. And it reminds you of when I used to work more with print. When, when designing a page, I'm always just thinking about what I want to do. I don't get out like a ruler and measure the gutters, like that's ridiculous. Why are we still doing that? That's for computers to do. So, I have five minutes for questions, awesome. Anybody else have a question? Yeah, I can't see you because there's this huge light. Uh, but I see there's a there's a being over there. 
that stood up. <laughs> Uh, you could, but I mean, I think most of the time it's really your own fault. It's not the fault of the program. It writes pretty tight code. Uh, just the fact, like, if you are, if you are not using um, SAS and Compass and these things, but you're not compressing the file, then you're still probably going to get a smaller file than if you're writing all your code manually. Uh, you know, I th again, I, I go to the graph of the 80% of the people that use it really, really love it. If you haven't tried it yet, go for it. Um, I think most of the time when you see bigger files than you need because of over nesting, then don't stop nesting so much. I mean, you don't have it. You could just write the same CSS that you write yourself. You can write um, in SAS. So, if something's making it bigger, don't don't do that. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to hear more about your thoughts on uh, making the HTML more semantic. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I tend to be more pragmatic about how I do things. Uh, and with these libraries, I try to take advantage of however much I think I want and make sense for the project. So um, I do like containers. But what I don't like is call 3 MD, you know, this XS extra small. Like, I don't like to see those in HTML because when I have to redo the project, I have to go, Oh, how, I got to check all the HTML pages that may be generated by some sort of script or some sort of uh, automation that um, I don't really, I, that I can't stand. Uh, containers, yeah, I, st I, I still use containers. Sometimes it's the only way to accomplish certain things. But what I'm talking about is really getting rid of like all those column code, you know, non-semantic column type things that are on your HTML. They don't belong there. But containers, I think, I think it's okay. You still need them because you can't do certain things without some containers, so hopefully that makes sense. Anybody else? All right, that's all I have for you guys. I think I'll, I wanna give enough time for somebody to come up and ask me a question if they want to, so um, that's all. Thank you so much.